Mary, in her great prayer of praise to God, the Magnificat, where she praises God, who puts down the mighty from their throne and exalts the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty. These are dangerous words. In fact, in some governments now in Latin America, they have outlawed the Magnificat in public prayer. We discover Mary as a woman who had, in fact, a mind of her own, who had autonomy, who had struggles who had her own faith life to live out in a journey of faith, as Vatican II so well puts it, and comes through as a self-initiating, strong, powerful woman. She is not, according to the scriptures, repellently pious. That's Paul the six words about her. He's afraid too many people think of her that way. But she is a real woman who in her own time and place gave herself to the coming of the reign of God she, in the beginning of her life, gave her that tremendous yes, as we said, without consulting male authorities, to what God wanted her to do. And she dealt with all the turmoil in her life that resulted from being an unwed pregnant teenager, to being a refugee mother, to being the mother of a crucified criminal. At the end, she is there in the upper room in the midst of the disciples, waiting for the coming of the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, it falls on all of them. She is at the heart of the church and at the birth of the church. And she is with them at the beginning of their preaching ministry to all the nations. And what comes through this way? Women own her as one of us, as our sister in faith. Not only our mother, but our sister. As a real woman uh, who can model, not just for women, but for men, what it means to hear the word of God and keep it. At the Second Vatican Council, the bishops were of two different minds. One group, generally thought to be the more conservative group, did in fact want to bring out a special document about Mary. On the other hand, the other group of bishops, more in tune with the biblical and ecumenical and liturgical renewals, did not want to focus on Mary separately from her relation to Christ and to the Church. It was the closest vote of the council, a very emotional debate. Many of the bishops were in tears by the time it was over. But the slim majority ruled, you might say, and so the teaching of Vatican II that we have does, in fact, incorporate Mary into Lumen Gentium, into the document on the church. Some would say that devotion to Mary is an aberration. I would say, in contrary to that, in contrast, it really is exemplifying very deeply Catholic principles of what we believe. Namely, we believe in a God who is a God of people, a God who is the God of the communion of saints. That, for me, is a very beautiful, powerful notion. We don't just believe in God. We believe in God and God's people, God's saints. When we talk of the saints, we very quickly move to Mary as queen of all saints. So that when we have devotion to Mary, we're saying something about the shape of our Catholic faith, that, that God is present with us in many ways, above all in Jesus Christ, in the scriptures, but also through the men and women of history, the saints of God, the saints in heaven, even the saints on earth. And Mary would be, as we said, the queen of saints, the exemplar, a model saint, because exactly of her relationship to Jesus Christ. Devotion to Mary and theology about Mary has always been related to the culture in which this takes place. If we take Africa, in Africa there is a powerful sense of union between the living and the living dead, 
or the ancestors, as they call it. And this view of tribal religion is being brought into Christianity, giving a new life to the communion of saints idea. And Mary, in that understanding, is understood as the great mother ancestor of the people, someone who has gone before us and is part of the living dead, the mother of the people. You might almost say the grandmother of the tribe idea. In Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean countries of Europe, there is a different approach, uh, Italy, Spain. There's an approach to Mary there, highly warm-hearted, very affective, the feeling that Mary is a link we have to what is holy and beautiful in our lives as our mother, as someone who is to be highly honored uh, and brings the person who has devotion to her into a, a, a zone you might, I keep thinking of warmth. In Latin America, there are two views of Mary and they're struggling really for supremacy one over the other. One is the more traditional view that understands Mary as mother of God, herself a goddess. We have, for example, in Our Lady of Guadalupe, or many of the other local devotions to Mary in Latin America, a transference to Mary of the Indian goddesses which were stamped out by the Spanish colonial conquerors, or the Portuguese conquerors. And the devotion to Mary, she was the only feminine figure that came in with Christianity to the Indian tribes. And what was transferred to her was the iconography, the colors of the dress, the music, and again the devotion of the Indian people On the other hand, in Latin America, uh, an emerging view of Mary is the liberation theology view, that Mary herself is a poor person, a woman of the people, a village woman, a rural woman, whose life was lived amid oppressive hardships. Her people were a conquered people. She had to give birth far from home and without comforts because of the will of a dictator who made people go to a distant town to register. Then. She's seen as a refugee woman who flees with her child from a murderous ruler who wants to kill the people. This view of Mary gets tremendous resonance among people involved in violence in their lives because of their governments. And then, of course, at the end, she is the mother of a crucified criminal. The mothers of La Playa in Argentina, who demonstrated daily for their disappeared children, had Mary as their protector there because her child also disappeared due to an unjust ruling of a government. North America and Western Europe, I would put together the countries of the Western democracies, as since Vatican II, two things have happened. On the one hand, there has been noticeable diminishment in these countries of devotion to Mary in the traditional ways. Novenas are not as well attended, shrines are not as well visited. Um, people do not have the same devotion as previous. The Pope has commented on this, conferences of bishops have commented on this, it's public knowledge. Why this should be so, some have said, well, with the discovery of the scriptures again, with the discovery of Eucharist and Christ at the center, there is no longer a need for Mary and the other saints to bring to us the nearness of God as they did before the council, since that is now uh, assumed more directly in people's spirituality, perhaps. Pope Paul VI commented that a, uh, a more traditional view of Mary was tied to traditional culture. And in the countries of the first world, especially today, culture is shifting, especially the emergence of women. And this is the second thing happening in North America and also Western Europe. The position of women is changing very rapidly, which then brings a new view of Mary once again into play. Mary's example calls us to look upon our suffering sisters and brothers 
and take sides, even as she did in the Magnificat, with the lowly against the proud, and with the poor against the powerful. The issue of uh, appre appreciating the feminine in our church is a very major challenge which we have in the church today. It might be correct to say that we have always spoken of Mother Church, but Mother Church had a very male face and a very male voice. Uh, and um, uh, probably the Catholic Church is one of the most male chauvinistic organizations in the world. Um, and therefore, we have a lot of catching up to do to do justice to the importance of the feminine and the importance of women in our tradition. Well, the church has always been seen as uh, a mother and as a bride, uh, so that uh, a kind of a, a feminism in the church is not a new thing uh, in Catholicism, uh, but uh, perhaps it needs to be accented in a new way to uh, uh, meet the challenge of contemporary feminist thinking. But I think we have great resources there uh, in our devotion to the Blessed Mother and the other feminine uh, saints. Um, and uh, we must remember that God himself or herself uh, is above uh, the differences between male and female. God is transcendent, uh, and transcendent in relation to sex differences too, so that we can't appropriate uh, male language entirely or exclusively to God. We point out today that men who are dominating in the church and continue to be dominating also uh, encourage a, a very strong devotion to Mary. So obviously, the, the way they're conceiving Mary is not a threat to male dominance. And when you look at the kind of Mary, the image of Mary that's put forth, um, what do you see? And here are the things that are being criticized. First of all, you see that she, her role in life, it seems, and her characteristics always was to be a mother. Uh, one uh, woman did a study of 200 Marian hymns and almost every one of them speaks to Mary as a mother. And the verbs in those hymns have the command, the imperative tense, give to us, do for us, be for us, bring to us, care for us, and so on. The gimmies, you know, um, which, by the way, leads to a spirituality of immaturity that one is always looking to the mother for uh, help rather than taking responsibility in one's own life. But the point is this. That is then made as the model for women. And it is said women's... Uh, greatest role in life is to be a mother. Now we'll see. Yes, be a mother is a marvelous thing. But women's life is not exhausted in mothering, much more to being a woman than being a mother, as mothers themselves will say. Uh, but it's reduced to that and made to be the ideal. So if a woman steps outside of being a mother, somehow she's not being feminine anymore or not being a woman. So it's this tyranny of motherhood put on as an identity for women, the way fatherhood is never made part of the intrinsic identity for men. And Mary has imposed that uh, over and over in the church. If you read sermons and homilies and even today, uh, writings, pious writings, this is the way it, it gets to be. Uh, the other thing about Mary that comes through always and criticized is her lack of self-initiative, the way she's been presented, her passivity, uh, she always does what she's told. She seems to have no mind of her own, etc., etc. And she also seems not to have any sex. Uh, this emphasis on Mary as the virgin bleaches her of any genuine female sexuality. So, as Mary Gordon, the Catholic novelist, has written very poignantly, she had to exorcise herself of Mary and the ideal of Mary that was given to her in Catholic high school in order for her to discover her own intelligence and her own sexuality. And both intelligence and sexuality are vital to the coming of age of women in our society today. Even with regard to Mary's motherhood, the fact that she was a virgin mother puts her beyond the reach of any woman who's a mother uh, in our own society. Um, when I was in South Africa last year, I was very moved by a group of Catholic women who said to me they gathered to pray the litany for justice in South Africa and the litany of Mary. 
but after a while it began to disturb them and now they leave out of the litany that petition that says mother undefiled because to praise Mary for not having had sex and to praise her for being undefiled somehow demeans the women who have had sex and whose motherhood comes about through sexual uh, activity and which is blessed of God and they felt it was demeaning to themselves to honor her that way and this was not a group of theologians this was a group of of Catholic women whose consciousness you see is raising as to how Mary has been used to diminish the reality of womanhood the last point here in terms of the critique and this cuts very close to the bone because it's still being done by the official magisterium Mary is held up as a model for women only and Jesus is held up as a model for men and Jesus who is the Son of God and of course our center in the faith becomes the endorsement for men to be the center and the leaders and Mary as the one who gave her life to hear him and be a disciple is then held up as the model for women to hear the men and be their disciple and we have many examples of this in official magisterium Jesus preached and Mary listened therefore men preach and women listen and that is the service we give to one another etc in other words Mary's rightful role vis-a-vis -vis Jesus is naively translated into sociological roles for men and women in the church today and Mary who did not exercise apostolic ministry is taken as the model to keep women today out of exercising apostolic ministry and women are extremely critical of that ideological use of Mary to block women in ministry even in the church today so the critique goes very deep Mary cuts across all denominations. Mary appears in every part of the world. In Mexico, she appears as a Mexican. In Yugoslavia, she appears as a Yugoslavian. In some way, there is no real one image of Mary when one starts looking at the whole history of Marian devotion unbelievably in some way the most ecumenical aspect of the Christian faith is Mary herself she takes the form of whatever situation she finds herself in when one starts studying simply the apparitions of Mary the way she is seen one cannot really look at the Lady of Guadalupe. She appeared in the context of the world she was in with a message that related to the people, and yet that message is tied to the larger Christian message. Let me be very clear. What is the official position of the magisterium of the church about apparitions? The official position is that apparitions belong to private revelation, what is called private revelation. Public revelation is Jesus, the disciples, written down in the scriptures and interpreted publicly by the magisterium of the church. Private revelation are insights that individuals may receive that perhaps interpret the public revelation or give a way of living a life but do not ever have the official status of the gospels of the scriptures and of the tradition now the church has never interpreted or officially said what goes on in an apparition how does one of these 
happen. This they have left to theologians. But officially, the church has always says this. Once it has been investigated and approved by the church, what is approved is the message and the devotions springing from it, so that if you choose to follow that, you will not go off the gospel path. And it might interest you to know that about one out of every 200 apparitions investigated by the church are ever approved. That's a very small percentage. And if you look at the ones that have been approved, the message is, as you said, peace, penance, prayer for others, prayer for conversion, etc. That is, that is mainline gospel. The apparitions that do not get approved frequently are exclusionary, they involve forms of violence, they involve some form of superstition, uh, some form of vain credulity, as Vatican II called it, that would lead us off a gospel path. Who receives these apparitions? It is usually given to poor people, to children, to uneducated people, to rural people, and to women. These people are outside the normal channels of access to divine power. They are not ordained, they are not part of the hierarchy, and this gives immediate access to the nearness of God, to a person and to people who themselves feel outside those channels of immediate access. Skilabex calls it a hermeneutic of the nearness of God to the little people, that this is what's going on in a genuine apparition. And it's interesting, every one of these apparitions almost immediately always meets official disapproval. And Skilabek says, well, of course, because it's bringing a challenge to the official church. Somebody else is, re is the recipient of divine power outside the ordained channels. It was interesting once I was speaking to a group of bishops about this, American bishops, and said to them, have any of you ever had an apparition? And they all laughed. And I said, you don't need one. <laughs> you already have the access to divine power. Something is going on on the edges of the church, what Karl Rana calls the charismatic element of the church. Is it the need for a theophany? Is it the need for closeness to God among people who do not find the official channels of the church bringing that closeness? I would say very clearly, in, yes, in, in the officially approved cases, yes. When you go to Lourdes, the feeling of sacredness there is powerful. People have prayed here. Heaven and earth have met here. The faith, you can taste it there. Uh, and you don't have to be somebody important. In fact, Lourdes is famous for the sick who come there and find themselves the important people. The sick who usually are relegated to invisibility in our institutions and in their beds. Suddenly, they're the center there. The last shall be first. This is what's going on. Since Vatican II, Pope Paul VI issued a very beautiful exhortation in 1974 on devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. For me, it's a perfect example of the renewal of Vatican II being applied to Mary because it looks at her from a deeply scriptural viewpoint, historical viewpoint, and very honestly, the Pope says that at times there have been exaggerations or difficulties with devotion to Mary, but he's not willing to let it go, so he tries to retrieve it in its proper, beautiful form. In a more traditional piety of Mary and the saints, before Vatican II, we had what I call the patron-petitioner model of ourselves and the saints. We, the living, felt ourselves at a great distance from God, needy and sinful. We felt that God was a judge. And what we needed to make life bearable was a way of getting closer to the divine mercy and the divine love. And who gave us that way was Mary and the saints. They were the mediators between ourselves and Christ and God in the sense that they were between us and Christ.
it was ourselves, then it was the saints and Mary, and then there was Christ and God who were way beyond us, and somehow Mary and the saints went back and forth in between there as our powerful patron to our needy selves who were the petitioners. Now, what Vatican II did was shift that model in Lumen Gentium to what I call a collegial model, a solidarity model, the idea that we are all brothers and sisters together in Christ. traditional dogmas about Mary, the Immaculate Conception, that she was conceived free of sin and therefore she was conceived in grace, and the Assumption, also have powerful residences today for women. Because what that is affirming is that here you have a woman, a female, in a woman's body with a woman's psychology, who is full of grace, who is triumphant over evil, both in her coming into the world and also at the end of her life as an example of what women's nature is capable of rather than the inferiority of women. The full participation of women by nature and by grace in the power and the love of God is what Mary can sign to us if we interpret those dogmas even um, in a mature way.